This is Baptism Sunday, folks. Yes, yes. Some of you are already excited. You're like, man, that's great. And others of you, if I can be honest, you clapped politely because you're like, yay, I don't know what that means. Um, and uh, it's okay. So I'm gonna get out of the way in a moment, but I just wanted to, to answer a question for you of, of what, what is this and why is it a thing worth celebrating? What is baptism exactly? Because if it's a symbol, symbols are only meaningful if you understand what they represent. If you don't, then it's just confusing to watch. But if you understand what a symbol means, suddenly you grab the meaning and it can become meaningful to us, all of us. And it's interesting, when you look in the New Testament, the New Testament stretches its arms wide to wrap in a bunch of different pictures, images, metaphors to help us understand what's happening in this a sacrament. We call baptism a sacrament. It means a sacred moment, a holy moment, an important moment. And many of us understand, hey, I, I think it is important, but I don't understand fully what's going on with this. And, and there's all kinds of different images the Bible grabs. It grabs the idea of a, of a rescue from condemnation. First Peter talks about that, and he grabs the imagery of Noah being rescued in that ark across the waters. 1 Peter 3 says, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That one of the pictures in baptism, when we've got uh, 12 people being baptized uh, no, excuse me, uh, 11 people being baptized today, five in this gathering and uh, six in the next. We, we're not re baptizing anybody. Five, this, and six. Nine. Just clarifying. A little housekeeping. Uh, one of the things it pictures is, is uh, the acknowledgement, like in Noah's day, that, that water, uh, that flood was God saying, hey, I am just, and when I see evil, evil must be dealt with. And we want a God who's just and calls wrong, wrong, and he will condemn evil. But is there a way for God to condemn evil, but rescue people that maybe got some evil inside? Because all of us are beautiful in the image of God, but broken because of sin, every single one of us. So we want a just God to condemn evil, but can that God find a way to forgive us? Can he be just and the justifier? And in Noah's day, God said, yeah, I'm gonna bring this flood to judge evil, but I'm gonna create an ark as a means of rescue for those who will trust me and step into it. And, and an ark is not a boat, by the way, if you're wondering. Noah wasn't there steering them through the storm going like, hold on, kids. Like an ark means a box. It it's, can be translated coffin. That he's just in a box going, this is the means of rescue God provided. Maybe God will come through. And he did. And so part of baptism is acknowledging I'm part of humanity that's a mess because of sin. I've done some things that God justly condemns, and yet I'm acknowledging that God made a way of rescue. So I'm saying, though I deserve condemnation, I got grace. Thank you, God, for burying my past. Thank you for forgiving me. It's a symbol of what needs to be buried in the past. It's also a picture of transformation, that that old is gone and buried. Colossians 2 says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. It's saying not only am I rescued from condemnation, there's some things that got buried. There's some things in my past that needed to go away, ways of thinking, ways of believing, ways of living, places I haunted, things I used to do. There's things that part of my old life I'm letting go of. They're not a part of my new life anymore. Uh, Sam Houston, I'm from Houston, Texas. Sam Houston was uh, not a good man. And when he was baptized in Rocky Creek, they told him, Sam Houston, your sins have been washed away. And he said, God help the fish. Because <laughs> he understood there's a lot in my past that needs to get buried. And that's part of the acknowledgement of saying, hey, hey, I'm not saying I'm pristine, pure, clean. I'm saying I did a lot of broken, sad things, but God made a way of rescue and I said yes. And as I said yes, there are some things that were in my past that don't need to dictate my future, but I'm not gonna pretend they don't exist. I'm gonna acknowledge that God made a way out of them. That it's a picture of transformation. And I want you to notice in that part, Peter said it also, that, that it's, it's not the water that's gonna change you. He says, it's not the cleaning of the body. It's, it's a clean conscience as what? As I recognize him, what Jesus did, that the boat 
was that cross. That, that rescue was what Jesus did when he who knew no sin became sin for me. What he did on that cross was a transaction between heaven and me. That he took my sin, he took my condemnation, and he took my burial. And then he rose from the grave. And I'm going with him. And when I get in that water, I am picturing that visibly for all of you. That, hey, I was buried with him, but I didn't stay down. He rose, so I rise. And this is a symbol and a declaration to the world that I'm going with that man. Like a marriage, a wedding. You don't need a wedding to get married. You can go sign a piece of paper and it's done. But the wedding is a sacred moment because you're declaring to the world, I'm going with him. I'm going with her. And that's what this is. It's a picture of saying, I'm going with him. Going away from what I used to be and towards what I'm going to be. That it's a transformation that in Romans 6, it says we were buried, therefore with him by baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's a picture. We're not really gonna hold you under till you die, but you're buried with him. And when he rose, you rise. Rise where? To walk in the newness of life that we buried the past and we're entering into something new, that I'm being liberated, that my past doesn't need to dominate my future, that my tragedies don't dictate my story, but that I'm telling you I entered one thing and when God changed me through the finished work of Jesus, I'm stepping out something new. I'm not denying what I was, but I'm glorifying him because of what he's making me and my new life is gonna show you the transformation. But it's not just transformation, it's association. Part of entering into baptism today is making a declaration that I got some new community in me, that I've been clothed with Christ. Galatians 3 says, for as many of you who are baptized in Christ have put on Christ. He says, you put them on like a robe. Some of you are worried about them stepping in that water. You're like, man, I'm cold now. Don't worry, that tub's heated. Actually, you're gonna envy them in a beat, right? (laughs) It's the stepping out that's tricky. But when you wrap up in a robe afterwards, that's nice, right? Get a towel around you. And he's saying, hey, once you go through that, when you step out the other side, you're not wrapped up in your past failures, wrapped up in your old haunts. Some of your friends, neighbors, relatives might want to remind you and you go, no, I'm wrapped in something else. What defines me now, the first thing you see about me is who he is. The first thing you know about me is who he says I am. That I'm not wrapped in my failures. I'm not wrapped in my shame. I am wrapped in his love. I am wrapped in accepted and cared for. Not because I earned it, but because he's that great that I got a new identity now because of what he's done. And I got a new community that I'm not just baptized into association with him. I'm baptized into association with his family. When you get married, you don't just get knit together with that person. You get this whole new family for better or for worse, (laughs) the good and the ugly. And what I love about the Bible is it tells us you're, you're knit together into a bigger family and a bigger community. First Corinthians 12 says, just as one body has many members and all its members of the body, Though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slave, free, all were made to drink of one spirit. It says part of baptism is to acknowledge, hey, I'm stepping into a new community, a new family, and we come from all different backgrounds. Jews, Greeks, slave, free, high, low, winning, losing, all manner of people spread across the spectrum, ethnically, socioeconomically, politically, all across the spectrum. <laughs> God is forging a family because of the grace of Jesus Christ. It's that powerful. And you may not have a biological family to go home to this month, but you've got a family if you're in Christ that he is forging around the globe. And it's not just unity with his family, it's unity with him, with the very trinity. Jesus' last command to his disciples in Matthew was, was go there for uh, And he said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, I want you to go and tell people what I did, that they follow me. And then when you baptize them, do it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Tell them that this is an association with the triune God. And that would have instantly taken you, not from the, the end of the book of Matthew to the beginning of the book, because there's one baptism in Matthew where all three of those people are present, and it's the baptism of Jesus. Matthew 3, it says, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him, and behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. So I'm going to quit preaching in a minute, but let me say this. In the early church, they tried to wrap their arms around all these images and the way they would do baptism. 
And we're not going to do it quite the way they did. Uh, we had to change some of it. Didache is one of the earliest writings we have from church history. And they're like, use running water if you can, but if you can't, use still water. And there's no river here. We're not ready to dunk people in the Potomac. <laughs> uh, and they said, use cool water if you can, but if you can't, warm's fine. And today we're like, warm's fine. Um, <laughs> But I love the way they did it. When it was time for baptism, they would show up at the waters in their old clothes. That concert t-shirt from the night you regret. Uh, the jewelry that was a symbol of your success and status that you realized was such a vain thing to put your hope in. And they would show up in that stuff. And before they stepped into the water, they would turn to the sunset, to the darkness. And they would say, I renounce you. Satan and all your pump. And I love that because that next sentence always feels unnecessary. And your pump, like what does that mean? <laughs> pump is the performance and show and the ostentatious display of splendor. And they said, you promised so much and you lied to me. You told me life was found so many places where it wasn't. You told me there was hope in so many places and I went for it and grabbed it and it was ethereal and you took way more than you gave and I'm done with that life. So they would turn and cast out their arms and say, I'm done with it. And then they would strip off those old clothes and they would walk into the water. And when they were in the water, the picture they drew to mind was that last picture. Jesus didn't need to get baptized to wash away dirt. He wasn't dirty. But he said, I'm doing it to fulfill all righteousness. I wanted you in that water, so I got in that water. It's interesting, that's the last verse I'll mention is it's, it's also a command to be baptized. Does baptism save you? No, faith in Jesus Christ saves you. This is a declaration of that association. But it's interesting, in Acts 10, Peter's talking, and he says, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He's looking at people. They put their faith in Jesus, and the Spirit of God entered them. And he saw it, and he was like, these people have been converted. So they were converted before they were baptized. But afterwards he said, now I command you to get baptized. God withholds the right to say, because I said so. And I have so many people ask me that. They're like, why get baptized? I'm already saved. What does that represent? If it doesn't do anything, if it's just a symbol, I choose to pass on the symbol. I don't like getting wet. I've never been a fan of pools. And you go, that's fine. But the Bible commands you to do it. And sometimes as a parent, you'd reserve the right to say, I said so. Right? Because you understand, I'm trying to get my kid to do a thing they're not understanding the significance of. But if they can do it, they'll understand the significance later in a way I can't explain it. And I was just part of a baptism ceremony a few weeks ago, and I watched a number of people. That, that public declaration to the world, I'm going with him, had such a profound impact on them. That the physical act of going under and up in front of their peers and saying, I'm going with him, was so powerful for them, they would burst into tears. And... In that moment, they realize, oh, that's why he does it, because God knows us, that the physical is tied to the emotional, that's tied to the spiritual, and God does this. And when they entered the water, they thought, you know what, Jesus, he's standing here next to me. The Spirit of God, he's in me. And the Father is speaking the same words to me. That's my son in whom I'm well pleased. That when I step into the water, the triune God's wrapping around me and saying, this one's mine. That's my girl. That's my son. That one's mine. And then they'd step out of the water and were given a robe and the people of Jesus were waiting and threw an absolutely bananas party on the other side <laughs> that we got a brother now. We got a sister now. We got a celebration now. Look what God did for me and look what he's doing in you and look what he's doing in us. And it was a celebration. So churches do it different ways. When baptized, how many classes do you take? Do you just jump in the water? Do you wait a little bit? How do you do it? There's all kinds of different ways. We won't get into all the specifics. What we're gonna do today, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna use a, a hot tub and we're doing it inside because it's 30 degrees out there. I don't know if you picked up on that. So we're gonna try this. Pray for us, church, inside the Howard. And uh, we're gonna do this here and, and we're gonna have people get in the water with them and tell a little bit of their story so we can hear some of the context of how they're processing what God's doing in their life. And then they're gonna get baptized. We got five of them here. And when they come up out of the water, I think an appropriate response is to go nuts because they're doing this because God commanded us to and because they want to declare to this church family, look what God's done. I'm going with him and I want you all to know it. And that's something we're celebrating. And so let's, 
Let's not lose our minds for our favorite sports team and then golf clap someone to come into life in Christ, okay? Like I understand there's different ways. Sometimes powerful moments require solemnity and I'm not against solemnity, but I'm just saying this would be a moment to, let's be solemn on the front end and get a little crazy on the back end. Can we do that, family? Let's try that. Let's just try it.